All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thanks for coming. Um, and thank you for having me as uh, part of uh, the summit. Uh, so my talk is going to be a little bit different uh, from everything else you've heard so far. Um, I'm barely going to use the word privacy, at least for the first part of the talk, and, and you'll see why. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how we come to think about fundamental values, um, which is something that I don't think we talk enough about. Um, and then slowly, I'm going to work my way up to privacy, what privacy means, how do we figure out what it means, and how do we think about privacy in our technology, all right? So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I am a storyteller. Uh, so I spend a lot of my life working as a technologist, a programmer. Uh, and later, I became a lawyer. And then finally, uh, I became a novelist and a sci-fi uh, writer. And it turns out that all three professions actually are the same profession, uh, because in every case, you're building artifacts out of symbols. Uh, and these artifacts have to perform certain, uh, certain jobs following a system of rules. And so storytelling ends up becoming a thread uh, unifying my career. And storytelling is something that I'm deeply passionate about and something that we all need to think more about. Um, I'll begin by delving a little bit deeper into the word story, okay? So this, the word story that we have actually comes to us from Norman French, um, and it is not differentiated from um, history uh, until much later, uh, very nearly in modern times. And as part of that process, uh, story coming to mean a narrative, um, it displaced the older Anglo-Saxon word that we had for describing that kind of thing, which was spell. Spell semantically shifted over to mean uh, words with supposed magical powers. I think this is actually a very powerful image to keep in mind. Stories are related to spells. Deep down, they're really magical incantations, and, and they really are magical, uh, I, I, as I will attempt to show you. So why do I say stories are magical? Um, it's my belief that human beings are not persuaded by logic or um, data. We're, we're just not. Uh, ultimately, the only thing that we have an emotional commitment to, the only thing that really motivates us, um, are stories. Uh, stories are the way we make sense of the essential randomness of the universe. Uh, you can try to convince people through data and logic all you want, but in the end, the degree to which they're receptive to your arguments depends on the story, uh, how much of a story you and they share, okay? So uh, let me try to illustrate this through some sort of um, example, okay? So what I want you to do is to take 10 seconds, I'm gonna stop speaking for 10 seconds and you can close your eyes for 10 seconds, just to concentrate on some value, some word, some quality that means a lot to you, whether it's patriotism, faith, generosity, honesty, free speech, what have you. Concentrate on that concept for 10 seconds and just see what images come to mind. Okay, focus on that for 10 seconds. Okay, so for me, uh, this is what I was thinking, and this is what's coming to mind. Um, I, to my mind, uh, a particular memory came to me, and this is a memory that comes to me every time I think about this word. Um, it's this memory of my grandmother when I was a small child, maybe five or, or four, um, and I could see her sitting next to the bed, knitting a sweater. And because my grandmother had arthritis, her fingers were very gnarled and it was very hard for her to manipulate the needles. I could see her struggling with the needles, uh, having a lot of trouble. And uh, in fact, uh, I could see that she seemed to be straining quite a bit. So I asked her, Grandma, you know, does it hurt when you do that? And she said, yeah, it does. So I said, 
why do you keep on doing it then? Why are you still knitting? And she says, well, I don't want you to be cold. So the word I'm thinking of is uh, love. And, and for me, uh, you know, when I think about love, I don't think of story definitions. I don't think about the philosophical distinctions between uh, the love, um, God's love versus uh, uh, humankind's love. I don't, I don't think about all of those undergrad debates I had uh, around what love actually is. I think about that story. I think about that memory. Uh, that memory defines love for me. This is, I think, how all of us are. Um, whatever value word that you, you were trying to think about, what came to mind are unlikely to be actual dictionary definitions. They are stories, they are memories, they are personal commitments, experiences that somehow defined and, and, and put content into the abstractions for you. That's how we human beings are, right? Um, I'm an epic fantasy novelist, and I think that all of us really are, uh, they, we live our lives as epic fantasies. We're born into chaos. We don't really know anything. We know we, we start this journey in primordial chaos. And our parents uh, come to us like um, um, Dante's Virgil um, or Athena uh, for Ulysses. Um, they, they, they come to us and they, they become our guides, our gods into this unknown world. Their actions and their 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 acts, the way they 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 behave toward us, become our first mythologies, the the foundational stories of our being. Later on, um, you know, as we grow older, we learn from teachers, from professors, from friends, from everyone. But all of them leave us with stories that make up the epic journey of our own narrated self. We are uh, homo narratives. We are made by stories. We are formed from stories. Our entire core being um, is nothing more than stories. Ultimately, what happens when we grow older is we accumulate a set of personal mythologies, the set of stories that define what generosity means, what honesty means, what uh, being private, being public, being free, being, being in love, all of these things. We, each of us, acquire a set of personal mythologies that make the world have meaning, that, 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 that allows us to derive some sort of sense out of this very random universe that we're in. This is true not just of us personally, it's true of families. Families have their own family narratives. It's true of professions. Programmers have their own lore, their own set of stories that define what it means to be a programmer, engineers. Uh, uh, and it's true of entire cities and even nations. Uh, nations are defined not so much by uh, the traditional definitions, but by this shared sense of story. We say shared history, but honestly, what we care about is not history as it really was, but the story, the, 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 the narrative of how we come to make sense of everything we go through. All right, so having said all of that, the next thing I'm going to do is to take you through some children's stories. Uh, these are children's stories that, you know, I as a parent and those of you who are parents have likely read to your children. Uh, and my view is that stories are the vehicle through which we pass on our fundamental values to the next generation. We love our children in the same way we believe we ought to be loved. And so, the stories we tell the next generation literally carry the most fundamental, important values that we think should be passed on um, from generation to generation as each generation of children emerge on their own epic fantasy journey. And they, in turn, when they're adults, become the gods and demigods of other children's mythologies. This is how cultures pass down, how generations um, pass on their value from one to the next. Uh, and it's worth delving deeper into these stories. Okay, so I'm going to just read you uh, passages from these stories, and then I'm going to try to parse out what I think the values are. All right. So the very first one um, is something that I think a lot of us uh, who have a technical background uh, love. This is the beginning of The Hobbit. 
In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. And the next one. Um, halfway between Pooh's house and Piglet's house was a thoughtful spot where they met sometimes when they had decided to go and see each other. And as it was warm and out of the wind, they would sit down there for a little and wonder what they would do now that they had seen each other. One day, when they had decided not to do anything, who made up a verse about it so that everybody should know what the place was for. This warm and sunny spot belongs to Pooh. And here he wonders what he's going to do. Oh, bother, I forgot. It's piglets, too. Uh, this next one is from um, Frog and Toad. Uh, my, my daughters love this one. One morning, Toad sat in bed. I have many things to do, he said. I will write them all down on the list so that I can remember them. And I love this list. Uh, the list of to-dos uh, includes eat breakfast, get dressed, go to Frog's house, take a walk with Frog, eat lunch, take a nap, and play games with Frog. And then one last one. Uh, my older daughter especially uh, loved this one when she was younger. Good night, room. Good night, moon. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Good night, light and the red balloon. Good night, bears. Good night, chairs. Good night, kittens. And good night, mittens. All right. So when you read enough of these stories, um, I do think there's a set of coherent values that begins to emerge. And these are values that we seem to think are incredibly important to pass on to children, um, which presumably are the most important values uh, we hold as human beings. And I, I think I think these are the values as, as far as I can tease out of the readings. Um, we're creatures of society, right? Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, they, what, and, and Frog and Toad, what they care about more than anything else is the idea of society, right? Our friends are important to us and we prefer that we live close to them so that we can see them uh, whenever we want to. Uh, in fact, I would venture to say that this is one of the reasons why college is one of those times that feels so nostalgic to many of us because college is practically the very last time uh, as adults where all of our friends are very close to us um, and we can reach them whenever we want to. Um, we also like to play. Uh, it's incredibly important uh, that we as human beings have a chance to play. Okay, by play, I mean um, any creative act through which we experience growth, okay? So um, we prefer to do work that feels playful in some sense, that allows us to grow, that allows us to experience the sense of flow, that allows us to feel that um, we're creating joy for others and for ourselves. So playfulness is deeply important to us. Um, we yearn for a sense of rootedness, okay? So um, remember the Hobbit hole, right? That's a, that's a lovely home. Why is it a lovely home? Because it's a home that's rooted in nature that over which we feel a sense of uh, oneness and harmony. Um, as biological beings, we, we don't and we cannot exist in isolation uh, apart from nature. Uh, we really create that sense of, uh, of, of connection with greenery, uh, with life itself. And then that ties into the next piece, which is empowerment. Empowerment matters to us because um, what is an ideal house? An ideal house is a whole that you get to construct, shape the way you see fit. Um, and a, a, a room of comfort is a room in which you get to place the objects uh, that you want to place there, that you get to define. You get to define your own space in the same way you get to define your own self-narrative. Empowerment is important in that. And then finally, as part of that whole empowerment thing, we crave the ability to 
define ourselves, this self-definition. Um, Good Night Moon is so lovely to me because the subject, the little bunny, is naming everything in the room. Uh, this is reminiscent of that scene from the Bible where Adam names everything, right? So this this act of naming everything that's meaningful to us, it's it's primal. Uh, it's uh, it's we as children recapitulate the history of our species. We we name things to give them meaning, to fix them uh, in the world. Uh, some an object that has no name has no meaning, but by giving them a name and 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 describing them aloud, we have given that object a place in our world and made that object a part of ourselves. We like to be surrounded by objects full of tangible memories. It is actually important for us to be able to do that. Okay, so all in all, you know, when you put all of these together, society, play, rudeness, empowerment, and self-definition, we see a picture of how we think human beings ought to live. Now, in reality, very few of us actually get to live like that. Uh, part of modernity uh, is about the destruction of the way of, 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 in the very process of yearning and seeking and trying to get closer to that ideal world. We're somehow further and further apart from that. So for example, we love society, we crave society. So we've built social networks um, to bring that to us. But instead of feeling a sense of closeness with people, all we feel is a sense of terror, of fear, of isolation. Um, it's uh, we, you know, I just saw recently this uh, this this bit of data. Um, we have more dating apps now than ever, uh, but it appears that uh, young people, at least Americans, seem to be having less sex than ever. Uh, the very things that we use we build to try to realize these values that are deeply important to us seem to be pushing us further and further away from it it's a paradox of modernity uh, i obviously have some thoughts about why that is uh, and that is relevant for discussing um, today's topic okay so let me go on to the next step which is um, uh, a slightly different point and and that is what does storytelling have to do with technology? Well, it turns out that technology is, if you delve deeply um, uh, into its Greek roots, technology means discourse about skill, discourse about knowing. Um, so technology fundamentally is actually a type of storytelling. Technology is a storytelling exercise when you're acting as a technologist, you are in fact creating stories um, in concrete form. Technology is always about envisioning a way for people to use that technology. It's never, it never exists in isolation. It's always defined by the types of lives you're envisioning your users are using, are, are going to live in your technology, right? So um, I think a lot of us um, have probably seen this quote from before. Uh, Winston Churchill once said that we shape our buildings and then afterwards our buildings shape us. What he was talking about, of course, was the shape, um, the rectangular shape of the Commons Chamber uh, for the British Parliament. And his argument was that that square, that rectangular shape promoted conflict. It set up binary oppositions. It fostered the kind of two-party system um, so the very shape of the building determines the kind of politics that will be conducted. And it's a very powerful metaphor. And so, you know, if you want to be concrete and think about it, you know, think about the inventors of early internet technologies. So if you're my age uh, or older, you, you, I, you no doubt remember that um, when you were first going to college, you got assigned a Unix account and you could log into your university's Unix servers. And that was, for many of us, our first experience of true internet. Um, and it was incredible. You know, it was a multi-user system. You logged in, you could 
see if your friends were logged in. And if you want to talk to them, you could just send them a talk request uh, and you would type on the same screen, the same terminal in real time. Um, there, everything was in plain text. You use Telnet, you know, and that was how you, how you reached the, the servers. The designers of these systems were clearly envisioning a type of society that would inhabit that system. It's a society that has some sense of trust. Okay, the the permissions were really advisory. Uh, you 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 really were there to share. The idea of sharing was paramount. Um, it, the the idea was that this was a community in which people knew each other. They accepted certain norms. They had a certain level of, of expertise. Um, and you know, uh, I. I, I uh, Brian Kernan and Dennis Ritchie had these lovely books on the C programming language and on the Unix system. And I urge all of you to go read it if you're not familiar with these books, because they really describe in such lovely ethnographic detail the types of users, the types of lives these inventors were envisioning for, for those who would use their technology. So technology is storytelling. When you invent a technology, you're really telling a story about how people ought to behave, okay? So all of that aside, now we finally come to the topic that we came here to talk about, um, which is the idea of privacy, okay? So when you're talking about privacy, you start with um, a dictionary definition, uh, which is not terribly helpful, to be honest. Uh, I, I don't think, a dictionary definition gets us very far in terms of thinking about what privacy really means. Um, and of course, you know, if you're a lawyer like, like me, then you think back to Warren and Brandeis uh, and their famous law review article, The Right to Privacy, which in some ways uh, defined the modern idea of, of privacy. Um, you know, we are a very legalistic society, so we always love to think about these abstractions in terms of rules and rights and duties. So Warren Brandeis, when they thought about the right to privacy, they talked about four types of harms that could come from privacy invasion. Um, and many of these obviously are still relevant to us. But again, I, I don't think they get us very far because these words, they're malleable, they have, they have they, they're they capable of being stretched and twisted in one direction or in the other. And the reason why we have so much trouble agreeing with one another or understanding one another when we just talk and argue in abstractions is because before we can unpack a piece of text for meaning, we actually have to pack it with our own assumptions, baggages, our own experience of life, our own set of personal mythologies that I was telling you about, okay? So all of us come to these words, what does embarrassing mean, okay? Each of us has a particular story about embarrassing, about embarrassment, about what it means. Um, and because we all have different stories that give content to these words, oftentimes we talk past one another, okay? When you talk about, words like privacy or freedom of speech, your perspective on what this means is very different depending on whether you've been a victim of some sort of um, online event, uh, let's just say, or if you were an instigator of one of these events. Your perspective of uh, freedom of speech is very different if you're a self-professed troll where you believe that trolling is an important part of speaking truth to power versus if you're someone who has been on the other side of it and you view trolling as deeply unethical. Because of our own different stories and, and different experiences in coming at this, we're motivated by entirely different stories about what privacy actually means and what are the interests we're trying to protect. So what I think all of us need to do as technologists that that we have not done enough of is to think back to this whole idea I've been pushing all along, which is technology is a form of storytelling. Stories discuss, describe, and envision ways of living. We are defined by our stories. Uh, all we are, um, it's just 
sets of stories. And finally, in order to make sense of these contentious issues and trying to make sense of what privacy really means and how to how to protect it, we need to think about what are the stories that are motivating us to do the things that we do and how do they play into the values that are fundamentally really they, they, that, that really matter to us, right? So go back to those values I was talking about earlier, society, play, rootedness, empowerment, self-definition. How does privacy, the story about privacy you tell yourself impact each of those things? Is it about empowerment of the, the individual's self-definition, right? So let's take self-definition as, as, as the value, the taxes to think about. One of the ways uh, that privacy, for me, impacts on that is the whole idea of um, the right of you to shape your own personal narrative. <clears throat> now, that right is not absolute, but it is important, right? All of us grow and change over time as individuals. There are opinions we held at one point when we were 13, 14, that we would be embarrassed now uh, in our 20s and 30s. And opinions we hold as in our 20s and 30s may also end up being embarrassing to us when we're in our 40s and 50s. Um, if you are someone who has never experienced that, then you're among the very few. Uh, and, and you're also, I also feel bad for you because it means you've never grown, you've never experimented, you've never tried anything. But if you dare to try things, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to hold opinions and say things that you, as an older person, you would not say and think because you believe it's wrong. There is a sense in which we should have the right to maintain the privacy of things that in the passage of time ought to be forgotten. Um, if you say something harmful and mean to a childhood friend, you would not expect those things to come back to haunt you once you're in your 40s and 50s, especially if you've changed, if you genuinely fundamentally change and you no longer are the same person who did those things. There's a sense in which our discussion about privacy really doesn't encompass that because part of the way we build our technology is we have collapsed all time and space and all context, okay? Anything you say as a teenager will remain there forever and it will be uh, brought up uh, by those who simply do not like you later as a way to discredit you, even though that person may be an entirely different person than the person you are later. It, it doesn't really matter. We, we, we don't seem to have a way as human beings to establish those rules. If we see them in front of us at the same time, we tend to deal with them at the same time. So we don't talk about that as part of the discussion on the right to privacy, but why not? Uh, why, why isn't the idea that certain things ought to fade away over time part of the discussion about privacy? Why is it that we always talk about privacy in terms of the public-private distinction? What are the stories that motivate that whole view of the public versus the private? What are the, um, what are the stories that allow you to empathize with certain individuals as victims and not with others? So to me, the important thing about all of this is to think about the stories of privacy that we tell ourselves that determine the kind of things we end up doing um, to build privacy. It's important for us to think about how do we how do we um, build the technologies that will foster the, the visions of privacy that actually motivate us? And how do these stories ultimately shape who we are and what kind of um, stories we can construct for others? Uh, in the same way that technology is a storytelling activity, it's also a meta storytelling activity. It fosters the individual self narratives of all of us. You know, each of us get to define our own epic fantasy about society, about play, about rootedness, about empowerment, about self definition. Like I said earlier, we start out as children who don't know anything. We require um, 
our parents, our teachers, uh, mentors to make sense of the world, uh, to show us what love is, what courage is, what uh, speaking one's mind is, what it means to build something. And later on, we pass on those values to those who come after us. We love others the way we think we deserve to be loved. We empower others the way we think we deserve to be empowered. So when we go out to build the technologies of uh, that define the spaces in which people have to make their homes, form their self-identities, construct their own personal narratives, we have to think about what are the stories that we want to be told about us? And how do we allow others to tell those kinds of stories as well? So um, finally, you know, the, this, is, this, is, this is something that I'm really hopeful about, which is this. The one distinction between uh, technology as a storytelling activity and the story we're all telling collectively together versus some story you read in a book is this. Stories in books are fixed. They have an end and there's no way to change that. But the story that we are telling together now, the story of technology, that one is very much alive. There is no end and we get to define the future um, and, and the story that's going to be told by us with our own actions. So if you want to actually um, create a world in which there's more empowerment and more ability to create self-definition, to create, to give people the ability to control and to um, truly move forward and grow, then build the technology platforms, build the story of privacy that you want to see. You know, just like we shape the buildings and the buildings shape us, well, we get to shape the technologies and then they get to shape us and shape the world into the, in the direction that we wish to see. So um, all of you go out and tell the story you want to be told. And I wish all of you would, in fact, get to tell the stories that you want to tell. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. That was uh, amazing. Um, I, I love this uh, concept of storytelling and technology as storytelling and, and our lives as, as stories. Um, uh, just, a, just a quick kind of background because I didn't get a chance to introduce you earlier. So I'm just going to very briefly. Um, so Ken, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Ken is uh, many things um, and uh, my Original experience of you is, is as a science fiction author. Um, uh, I read a lot of science fiction and I've, I've read quite a few of your books, although I think I've barely scratched the surface in terms of uh, your actual <laughs> works that you've done. Um, uh, Ken is the author of um, many short stories, um, but also uh, uh, what he calls a silk punk epic fantasy series uh, called the Dandelion Dynasty. Um, his story, The Paper Menagerie, was the first piece of fiction to win three literary awards, the Hugo, the Nebula, and the World Fantasy Award. Um, so with, with that, well, let's dive into uh, some fun conversations about stories. Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, first question is like, what's, what's, what's your story about um, how you think about uh, privacy yourself? Like you talked a little bit, you know, kind of like as a, as a culture and so on, like, when you think of being private in your own life and, and think about that from the, the, the real world and the virtual world, you know, kind of digital versus, versus everything else, um, what, what do you, how, how, do you, how do you live your, your kind of truth in that? You know, it's, uh, this is an incredibly difficult question to answer actually, because you know, part of my talk is also about the ways in which our ideals are so far apart from um, the lived reality that, that we actually have to go through, right? So, so, so many of us know and 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 realize and and want that connectedness, that broodedness, that sense of society with our friends, but we don't seem to be able to reach that kind of life. And it's the same thing with privacy. You know, many of us know, in some sense, what we ought to do to maintain privacy, to be able to um, live the sort of empowered self-defined life we want to live. But in practice, we can't. I mean, you know, I end up uh, allowing myself to sign up for social networks that follow me around. I, I end up using
Sorry, we lost Ken's audio, but he's uh, he's working on that. One second, folks. Oh, good. I, I thought it was my audio that I lost uh, for a second. <laughs> I think Ken's coming back with some wires. Um, well, good, Ken. We're, uh, we'll just hang out here for a second. Um, uh, can you all, all know? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. No? Why, is, why is the trick? We got you. I can hear you. Derek, we good? Yeah, okay, cool. I can hear him. Okay, you. how about now? Yeah, yes. perfect. Back? Yes. Back. I can't hear you for some bizarre reason. So hold on a sec. Let me um, let me fix this. Uh, okay. So sorry. Give me thirty seconds to retrieve another sure. pair of headsets. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit just as Ken's getting ready. Um, one of the uh, one of my favorite stories, um, which I was talking to Ken earlier today about, is um, uh, a story. It's a short story called Byzantine. Em um, Empathy okay. and uh, can you get? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. We can hear you too. I was I was just uh, doing oh, a little wow. ad lib while you were ready, so yeah. we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is this is technology. Uh, the yeah, more we need something is the more you have. To... <laughs> yeah, anti fragile. <laughs> well, luckily, I I was prepared. Uh, I I had other backup systems. You see, backup systems are important. But this is good because that now the audience realizes that we're humans and they can relate I, to us. Like we we also have these problems. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how advanced something is and uh yeah this always happens so anyway go back to to, to my earlier point um i know what's good for me but I, I i can't seem to resist the temptation to do things that i think are terrible and you know i think i think that's actually one of the mistakes we make about the whole privacy narratives we always make it into something about the user's fault. It's always the user who must make certain choices um, uh, in order for things to work. Uh, but it, it can't be about that. You know, as I was saying, it it can't just be about let's present the most horrible things possible and let's tempt you into it. And and we we require every user to become the most thoughtful, advanced technologist possible and to think through all the consequences and every decision when you make it, you must think through how I will feel about this when I'm 30 years older. Uh, that, that's, that's just not human. That, that's not, it, it's neither realistic nor is it moral to really make that kind of decision the default rule. Uh, we really have to foster and think about how do we build our technologies in a way that preserves context, that gives people control that tries to minimize the potential for harm. Uh, you know, do no harm, I, I think ought to be um, the rule in technology uh, as it is elsewhere. Yeah, um, I think uh, it is such a challenge. I, I'm you know, also a, a guilty of um, being on Twitter, being on Instagram, you know, doing, doing things that you do to be part of society uh, today. and. Um, I have friends who, who opt out of these things, and um, yeah, well, they're still friends. But I, I don't get to share these these moments that they they would uh, they'd be sharing otherwise. Um, obviously, there's extremes these things, and there's I, I definitely have a public persona which is different from my private persona, and I think that's um, one of the practices I, I believe is important is you know to determine whether you're well known or not well known. I mean, I, I've only got like. 7,000 Twitter followers are not that well known, but I just kind of, I, I think that you have to, for everybody, think about what it is you want to present to the world and what it is you want to keep private just to yourself or to all your close friends and loved ones. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, just kind of, I, I am, you know, kind of a bit of a sci-fi nut myself, and I, I get really excited with, uh, you know, thinking through science fiction. Um, one, one interesting thing I, I, I learned uh, a couple of years ago is, something to do with the history of science fiction, which is that um, it wasn't really till, the, there's some records of, you know, the Greeks and other people having sort of like visions of the future. And I guess maybe you could think of um, mythology and so on as almost like uh, modern day science fiction. I sometimes think that the, you know, like uh, the Avengers or something in the popular show is like sort of this, almost like a, a series of, of fables in terms of like, the, these are kind of guidelines for being good or bad and what works and what doesn't, betrayal, you know, kind of revenge. Um, but history of science fiction, science fiction didn't really become a thing until the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, because up until that point, if you were a peasant, you were going to be a peasant, your ancestors were going to be peasants, there was no, the, the sort of the, the, the time when you could be, um, I call it sort of the entrepreneurial age of the royals, that was over. By this point, 
that you know you couldn't just go buy a bunch of guns and kill some people and become a king. You just you didn't have royal blood, so it was over. So this idea of not wanting a different future because there wasn't a different future was was strange. And history of science fiction is that science fiction only really became a thing with H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and so on, all these people. So with that thinking process, um, how do you think that sort of science fiction today, and especially the way you write science fiction, which I know we talked about earlier, is, is, is quite different in terms of you're not really, well, I'll, I'll let you talk to that, but how, how do you think about the way science fiction is um, helping us think about the future or, or even shaping the future in terms of how we, how we uh, move into it? Well, you know, there's, there's several ways um, we can approach this. Um, you know, uh, I think all of them actually have merit. So one approach uh, that I think a lot of writers um, uh, like Neil Stevenson uh, being, being one example who take is the whole idea that um, science fiction can actually shape the future in a very direct way, um, you know, by, by presenting visions of the future that are optimistic, that are hopeful, that show the potential of, say, space travel or cryptocurrency or virtual reality, what have you, by, by playing out thought experiments of how a lovely um, techno-optimistic future can be, we can actually shape and, 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 and direct and bend the arc of history towards that future. Okay, so that's one way to think about the role of science fiction um, uh, and, and building the future. Um, I tend to take a slightly different approach. Um, uh, I'm, I mean, you know, we can talk about the way that science fiction can be used to critique the present and all of that, which is very interesting, but it's not the core of my focus. I, I tend to think that the way science fiction can be really interesting is, um, you know, having spent many years as a technologist and also later on uh, in, in, um, in the legal field as a, um, in, in patents, I have a particular perspective on the history of technology and, and how things actually evolve and how we actually invent things and engineer things and build things. And one of the things that, um, what I, that I've noticed is it's, it's very, very difficult to escape a tendency to tell stories uh, about what happened. It's very difficult for us to escape the narrative trap uh, and to think that the future um, follows story logic the way we would like it to. So, you know, concretely speaking, uh, one example would be, you can go back and, and look at the way um, uh, touchscreen interfaces evolved. Um, the, the fact that we ended up with what we have um, with, you know, Apple and Google all settling on the same essential interface, uh, it feels inevitable uh, in retrospect, but it's actually not. Uh, in the same, there were so many other paths that could have, we could have gone down and it's really fortuitous we ended up where we are. Uh, same thing with cars. You know, people sometimes are surprised to find out that um, some 30, 40% of the cars in the US were electric uh, back yeah. at the turn of the century, not this century, but the last one. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was actually a, a quite a battle. Um, yes, the, 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 exactly. The, the fact that we ended up with- the, or, or, even, or even the kind of electricity we have. Uh, for example, exactly. Is, is a, yet yet another one that the thing is, afterwards you can always go back and tell a just so story about how yeah. the way we ended up is the only way it could have happened. That's just mm -hmm. not true, not true at all. Um, so, in other words, I think predicting the future by extrapolating trends from the present is very much a loser's game. So I try not to engage in that at all. But I think science fiction is really, really good at the following, which is you can take current trends, extrapolate them out. And by exaggerating these things and, and by showing how human nature will, will, will play out uh, in this imagined future, you can highlight what are the fundamental human values you actually wish to preserve. You can ask questions about what is it actually, what are the things that matter to you, right? When you talk about, um, the importance of preserving individual choice and free speech. Okay, so let's let's take that. Let's 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 take that. Let's let's push technology and exaggerate and push it out the way that we want to. Oh, sorry. Um, am I still? Are people still having trouble hearing me? Or am I? No, okay? am I, I, I got you. Okay. So, in order to 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 press forward on this, you have to you have to actually think about 
how do we how how do we imagine this 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 future in which your sense of individual choice and free speech are totally under threat? What are the aspects you're actually trying to preserve, and and what are the other values you're willing to sacrifice? What what is uh, fundamentally the thing you're trying to protect? So. I think science fiction can be really good at asking questions and forcing us to define for ourselves the things that really matter to us, the things that we wish to preserve in cataclysmic change. So to your point earlier, um, um, Seven, where you pointed out that the history of science fiction really came out of this whole uh, industrial revolution, this, 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 you know, the time when mm -hmm. uh, the modern world really became the modern world. Yeah. Well, part of that is also this whole idea of, of um, we are now accelerating. Every generation is facing cataclysmic change, complete mm -hmm. transformation. Yeah, like every few years now. Yeah. Right. It, 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 you, you no longer can assume that you're going to live the life of your parents uh, and, and or, or even your brother or your sister, right? Exactly. <laughs> There's just so much change. Change is yeah. the only constant and in a way that is true now that was never true before. So mm -hmm. science fiction is great at forcing us to work out what are the things we're going to save when the house is on fire and when things are collapsing around us or, you know, when we're moving to Mars, what are the things that you actually care about? What are the things you're going to preserve? Um, and in that way, by forcing us to make our stories crisp, to forcing us to really bear down on our personal mythologies, I think it helps us to envision better futures. Again, you know, it, it forces us to articulate for ourselves, what are the stories that motivate us? What are the stories we would like to see? What are the changes we actually want to see in the world and how do we become that change? Um, science fiction can be good even without necessarily predicting the exact future just by forcing us to confront these questions. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good point, this idea of, uh, you know, how people even personally tend to rewrite their own history. Um, I was talking to a, a college student who, who really wanted to chat, and I said, sure, I'll chat to you. And he's like, how did you craft your career? And I was like, <laughs> well, like, mostly it was lifestyle choices because I wanted to snowboard here and I wanted to surf there. And then I wanted to row here. And I was just kind of like, it was like a, a series of random choices. And I tried to keep, make sure that it felt good. And uh, we talked before about some choices I made. And, but in the end, people do tend to rewrite this history. Well, I followed this logical step here and then this led to this. But many times in my life, I was just like, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. Um, I uh, want to switch gears now uh, briefly. We'll be short of time. I just want to kind of like really dive into the, some of these um, other areas that I think are, are related and we'll, uh, we'll knit them back together. Um, I want to switch into uh, decentralized systems and cryptocurrency. I'm going to read a, a short piece uh, to give you a break from, from talking. Thank you for, for eloquent words, um, um, which is a, a piece from um, a, a story you wrote called uh, Byzantine Empathy. Um, and this talks about a, a cryptocurrency um, um, empathium which uh, was developed essentially to disintermediate charities. And I'm gonna read a quote. Um, <clears throat> the array of custom-made ASICs in the humming rack along the wall was devoted to one thing, solving cryptographic puzzles. She and the other miners around the world used their specialized equipment to discover the nuggets made of special numbers that maintained the integrity of several cryptocurrencies. Although she had a day job as a financial services programmer, this work was where she really felt alive. It gave her the feeling of possessing a bit of power to be part of a global community in rebellion against authority in all its forms, authoritarian governments, democratic mobs, statism, central banks that manipulate inflation and value by fiat. It was the closest you could come to being an activist she really wanted to be. Here, only math mattered, and the logic of number theory and elegant programming formed an unbreakable code of trust. So that's from, uh, from your story, story, um, which I, I, um, I read. Um, you know, uh, like about a year or so ago, maybe more, and um, just re-listened to on on Audible because you know time is short nowadays. I, I just uh, try and stream the the stuff, even though I prefer to read. Um, without going deeply into that particular story, which which is fascinating, um, can we talk a little bit about how you think about? I know you have an active interest in this space. How you think about? Um, the sort of the movement, if you kind of call it that, sort of general industry that's developed, these, these communities, um, you know, without kind of like a history of this thing, but like, you know, where we've, where we've been, where we're going, like, and also um, that kind of question I had to, to Edward Snowden also is that, 
you know, kind of what's your call to action for this, this thing? And uh, the people, you know, like myself and my team and other people who many of the speakers, Zuko and so on, what's your call to action as far as like, how should we think about what to do next? You know, I, I go back to, again, the, the fundamentals, you know, what are the values that really matter to you? How do you remain human in the face of modernity and cataclysmic change? Uh, you know, I think uh, cryptocurrency, especially in particular Bitcoin, is uniquely interesting because um, I, I think that decentralization aspect uh, has not been emphasized enough. And, and I don't think uh, a lot of the mainstream coverage of it really uh, uh, is helping people to, to understand it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when I see these blockchain projects, a lot of them are actually not properly decentralized at all. Uh, they seem to be missing the point of blockchain. Uh, and, and decentralization is, is key. Um, and it's, it's, it's a story that you see played out again and again. You know, uh, one of the things about the, the contemporary world, even in the just the last five years or so is this rise of leaderless mass movement. Um, you see more and more of it. Um, but those of us who are familiar with you know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular know exactly what it is. Bitcoin itself is a leaderless movement. That's, that's very key that there is no leader. There is no central authority. There's no way to define what it is. What it is, is the math. And if you want to participate, you actually have to just do the work. That's all there is to it. Um, there, there's no, there's no magic. There's no, you know, gatekeeper. Um, there is no door. Um, you just have to get in there and do the work and everything is, um, done. Uh, there's, you, you don't need to trust anything. There's no narrative, if you will. Um, it's, it's one of those, uh, stories where the defining feature of the story is that it's aggressively story less. Uh, you, 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 you go in there and, um, you, you just, Follow the voting protocol. That's that's all there is to it. You do the work, um, you you get it. Um, there's something deeply attractive about all of this to us because I, I think the decentralization movement is very important to making sense of modernity. I, I think going deeper into what ails all of us, whether it's social networks, disinformation, uh, the tendency to press everyone to think the same way, what have you. The root of all of this is the sense of building things that are too big, that are not human scaled. Um, we seem mm -hmm. to have fallen into this worship of the super scaled. Mm -hmm. um, we, a, a supply chain is not a supply chain unless it's global. Um, uh, the, the business is not a business until it has become so specialized and so dependent on the yeah. global network that it's incredibly fragile as we've all seen, right? The more you globalize things, the more interconnected you make everything, the more fragile you also make the whole thing, the more you put everyone at risk and the more you force central authority on everyone, um, leaving little room for all the things I care about earlier, empowerment, self-definition, sense of connectedness. Society doesn't mean you are connected to everyone in the world. Society means you're connected to those you wish to be connected with, you're connected and share a context with those who understand your stories, who are part of your personal mythology. Um, we are pushing further and further away from that ideal by the relentless pursuit of efficiency and scale. I would much, much prefer that all of us try to push things into more local, more defined, more skin in the game kind of mm -hmm. context. Yeah, um, like shopping local or like, you know, kind of or, farm or, to table. Yeah, yeah do something locally. Yeah, help uh, your local community. It's, 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 it's building things rather than trying to, um, uh, to, to rent seek uh, right. going viral. Right. It's it's mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that you have to go local and try to build things, create things, because, you know, those of us who have built things realize this. It's so much easier to sit there and point out all the faults with something than it is to mm -hmm. actually build something. Um, you can criticize all you want about the buildings that are there, but to design one and then build it yourself, that is where you really are doing the hard work. And that is where you're really creating value. And that is the place where you're, you know, it's like, I'd rather be a storyteller, someone who writes stories, who creates stories, than someone who just picks apart other people's stories and say why they're not good. You know, I, I, I don't, I, I think too many of us are engaged in the process of 
criticizing, picking apart, and pointing mm-hmm. out faults. And not enough of us are in the business of building things. And I would like to see all of us try to throw yeah. more of ourselves into making things, building things. The hard work of actually, you know, I mean, like again in Bitcoin, the hard work is to prove, <laughs> to prove of work. That's that's all there is to it. You mm-hmm. actually have to do the work. Um, otherwise, you don't you don't get to you just you're you're not really participating. Uh, Criticizing and pointing out and, and 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 giving abstract opinions is not making a new story. It's not building a better story. And I think all of us do need to get into the business of building a better story. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, some of the things you mentioned there was, uh, I um, on a personal level, I, I visited Moscow um, years ago a couple of times uh, when I was um, uh, helping build a fund and. So sort of in the period when it was okay to go talk to Russian businessmen and raise money, but before it became like not such a good idea. And just seeing the scale of the buildings, one of the things that left with me this, you felt like a tiny, tiny person. And this, the streets, the you know, one side of the street is the size of a normal US highway. It's like just enormous. And there's this sense of like um, dehumanizing you by the scale of the thing. It made me think of that. You were talking about the sort of scale of the internet and how it's sort of dehumanizing us in our our tininess right we're always trying to get more twitter followers or more this and so on but we can never really get enough because there's always somebody bigger and is this sort of like race to edward was talking about this as well it's not almost talking about this sort of you know how we've become part of a game you know we're, we're like characters in this in this little video game um that that i mean that what you said there is the key that it's dehumanizing it's <clears throat> the scale of the thing dehumanizes us and it forces us to behave in a way that dehumanizes others so many of the problems that we talk about does come from the fact that these systems just inherently foster all of us to do do things that way um it's uh it it, 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 it you know the fact that you can just go walk about with your phone and um the systems will just record where you are. Uh, you know, you're, you're being permanently tracked. There, there is no, the, the, the whole narrative about the public-private distinction uh, in some ways is an invention to excuse the utter um, uh, immoral behavior of some of these platforms that we're building. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the idea that because you're in the street, therefore everything you do should be permanently recorded and, and therefore tied together with every other bit of data about you and, and that that's all totally okay is preposterous. You know, the idea mm-hmm. that you have no, no expectation of privacy in the way that lawyers talk about it is nonsense. Um, you know, law is also a storytelling activity and too many of us are willing to subscribe to this nonsense about, yeah. you know, direct government action, the public-private distinction, the expectation of privacy. Um, I, I would urge all of us to actually stop being so legalistic and to question the story we've been fed by our legal system of defining what privacy really is. Privacy is much more than what the law is willing to protect. Uh, we, we, we need to think deeper about, again, all of the things I talked about. How do you define yourself? Do you have the right to be forgotten? Do you have the right to control the context? Do you have the right to expect not to be tracked on a 24-7 basis? Um, it's, it's, these, are, these are very, very important questions, and we don't ask enough about them. We, the laws are set up to give them, you know, our, to, to give ourselves minimum protection, and we are settling for it. We should not be settling. I couldn't agree more. I think those are, those are great um, fighting words. Uh, and um, I don't actually think I have another question at this point. Um, so uh, I, um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's been a pleasure like learning more about you and your work and, and like actually engaging with you. Um, it's, it's always, uh, I was saying to you earlier, I, I'm far more nervous talking to a sci-fi author or, or perhaps a, an artist, which I also love, than I am perhaps interviewing a, a famous Hollywood star. But um, it's, uh, it's been, been amazing uh, getting to know you and, and understanding your perspectives. And I really think that um, you know, we should all take a moment and think through these things and think about what does privacy mean to us? What other values we're trying to embody? And, uh, and that should be the things that guide our work and, and our lives in, in, in all respects. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Ken. It's been a great pleasure.